Hello, some of the more keen and eagle-eyed viewers may have noticed some not-too-subtle hints about a secret project that I'm working on, and this is a project that's going to involve pathfinding. And I thought it would be a useful time to talk about an algorithm often used for pathfinding, the A-star algorithm. And to demonstrate the A-star algorithm, I've created an application in the console game engine uh, to explore and show how the algorithm works. And it's going to draw a yellow line, which is supposed to be the shortest path between the green and red elements of this array. Now I've got these in a, a tile style, but they don't have to be. These nodes could be in any kind of space you want. It's just it's convenient to work with them in a 2D grid. And I can choose a new start point and a new end point by holding down shift and control and clicking. Um, I've implemented the mouse features of the console game engine to do this. It's quite nice. And what we see is some of these cells go to a lighter shade of blue, and we'll discuss that in a minute, um, but it comes up with a path. And I can then place individual blockages around the maze, and we can see the path adapts to try and find always the shortest path. And if there is no solution at all, such as if I box in here the output, then no path can be found. And this is really quite fun to play with. The lighter shaded squares show the cells that have been tested for pathing. So you can see up here so, uh, where it's darker, some of these cells have just not been tested at all. And that's because the A star algorithm can reject certain paths earlier on. And it doesn't matter how convoluted the path is, so long as there is a solution, the algorithm should be able to find it. And it's guaranteed to be the shortest, under normal circumstances. Now normally in my videos I like to take an algorithm and build it up step by step, and so we can see what changes do what. But that's a bit tricky with the A star algorithm, because it doesn't work until it's complete. So to be a bit different, uh, I'm going to do a manual walkthrough of a simple A star algorithm, and then we'll implement the code. So let's go through a worked example. Here I've got a graph, but I'm going to try and leave the graph theory out of it. But we've got some nodes, and each node is labelled A, B, C, D, E and F. And in between the nodes I've got some lines, which represents the distance between the nodes. I've started off by uh, marking my starting point, which is node A, and I've marked my ending point, which is node E. And for the algorithm we're going to visit each node, and we're going to run a little routine, and through a combination of goals we can work out the shortest path. Now, this may look a little complicated to start with, but it actually isn't that hard at all. And once we get going, you'll see the rules are quite simple. I've initialised the graph to uh, show the local and global goals for each node. Now, the global goal is really a measure of how well is the algorithm performing, how close to the end result is that node. And this will be given by heuristic, which is effectively um, the line of sight, the as the crow flies distance between that node and the target node, and we'll be updating this and biasing it as we go through the algorithm. The local goal, marked in blue, is used to compare nodes, so nodes can exchange information with each other about whether they're potentially the shortest path or not. The final structure is a list, and this will be lists of nodes that have been discovered by the algorithm that need to be tested. And right now at the start we've only got one, it's our starting node. So that's listed as A, and I've also included the global goal, because we'll want to sort this list later on. So let's get stuck in. The algorithm goes as follows. For each neighbour of A, we want to run some code. And in this case it's the first neighbour is going to be B. So we've discovered a new node, we need to add that to the list which is B, and currently its global goal is infinity. And the calculation is as follows. I take my current node, which is A, I take the local goal value, I add it to the distance to my neighbour, and if that sum is less than my neighbour's local goal value, then I get to update my neighbour. So in this case I've got 0 plus 2, and 2 I believe is less than infinity, so we definitely want to update node B, and we'll update it in the following manner. First thing we'll do is give node B a parent, which in this case is A. And then we want to update node B's local goal with the 0 plus 2, which becomes 2. And then we want to update the global goal, which is the local goal, 2, plus the heuristic. And in this case our heuristic is this direct line of sight value. This could be calculated with Pythagoras' theorem or any other equation you want that represents the space of your environment through which you're planning a path. But in this case I'm just going to take the obvious route, which is about 3. So I'll update the global goal to 2 plus the 3 becomes a 5. And we mustn't forget to also update that in our list. 
Don't forget these nodes will be objects in code, so when you update them in one place, they're updated in all places. We're done with B for the moment, so now it's time to check A's next neighbour, which let's say is E. And we do exactly the same again. We've discovered a new node, so we'll add that to the list. We'll add its current global goal, which is infinity. And we'll do the following check. We'll take A's local goal, 0, add it to the distance between the two, and if it's less than the neighbouring node's local goal, then we update our neighbouring node. So 0 plus 1 is less than infinity. We're going to see this pattern for the start of the algorithm. So we get to update E, we set its parent. I'm going to use green, if you haven't noticed already, to represent the parents. And I want to update the local metric, 0 plus 1, and we write that into neighbouring node's local goal. And then for the heuristic, we take the local goal value, which in this case is 1 for E, and we add it to our heuristic value, which I'm going to say is 5 in this case. So that gives us a total of 6. I'm going to get rid of the dotted yellow lines because I'm already confused, and I'm sure this won't help. We've updated E now, it's time to move on to F, which is the final neighbour of A. So we take the 0, we add the 3 to it, is that less than the infinity? Yes it is, so we get to update it. But we've discovered a new node as well, so let's also add that to the list. F with infinity. Oh, I've already forgotten to update the E infinity. That's now changed to a 6. This is quite important that we do this. So we know that uh, we've got a new parent node for F. This becomes A as well. And we can update the local and global scores. So we update the local by taking the 0 plus the 3. That gives us 3. And we can update our global by taking the local and adding the heuristic to it. So in this case, it's the 3 plus this 1, we'll assume, is the distance to the end goal, which, of course, becomes 4. And we'll also change that in our list. We've run out of neighbours for A now, so we can remove that from the list, and we'll mark A as being visited. We're not going to want to process it again, so we won't add it to the list again. We may still update it, but we won't be adding it to the list. And once we've removed A, we also then want to sort the list. So here we can see we've got B, E and F, but actually the order should be 4, 5 and 6. So we'll move the F to the front, because we want to sort in ascending uh, global goals. Because this gives us the best chance of finding the shortest path. Because what our algorithm has learnt so far is that B is potentially 5 away from the end result, E is potentially 6, and F is potentially 4. So we may as well start with the most promising node. So we'll take F. And then we repeat the procedure. We first check its neighbours. Well, its first neighbour, let's assume, is A. So we'll do the routine again. We take F's local value, we add it to the distance between them, 6. Is 6 less than 0? Well, no, it's not, so F doesn't get to update node A this time. Let's move on to its next neighbour, which is E. So we take the local, 3 plus 1, which is 4. Is that less than E's local, 1? No, it's not, so we don't get to update E this time. Well, we'll check F's final neighbour now, which is D. So we found a new node, so we'll just add that to the list. And we know that we take the local, 3, plus the distance, 1. Well, 3 plus 1 is less than infinity, so yes, we do get to update D this time. So we'll set the parent node to F, i.e. this is the node that updated it last. The local goal we can set to 4. That's the local goal of F plus the 1. And we can update the heuristic, which is the local goal of D, plus, well, the distance to the end, which in this case is 0. So that also gets set to 4. We'll update that in the list. Four. So the final step is we've now visited F, we've done processing it, we've checked its neighbours, we can tick that off, uh, and we want to resort the list again. Well, in this case, it's just moving the D to the front. Now, it's clearly obvious we've found a path. We've got from node A to node D, we go through F. But we don't know if it's the shortest path. It's not bad, but there could be better ones. So we don't want to stop the algorithm prematurely. It's found a path, which is great, but it's not necessarily the shortest path. Now, because D is our target path, we don't really want to update any nodes from it. It doesn't really make much sense that the path would be going backwards and forming loops. So we don't actually check D. We can remove that from the list, which leaves us with B and E. Well, B has two neighbours, so let's check against A first, and we'll check if the local of B, 2, plus the distance 2, is less than A's local. Well, it isn't, 
So B doesn't get to update A, and that, that's good, that makes some sort of sense. B's only other neighbour is C, so we've discovered a new node, which is C, and that's infinity. So we've now got B's local, 2, plus the distance, 1, gives us a 3. Is 3 less than infinity? Yes, it is. So B gets to update node C, and so we'll set the parent of node C to node B. And we can update the local score as being B's local plus that distance, that becomes a 3. And we'll set the global score as being C's local goal, which is uh, 3 plus the distance to the end. So this gives us a 5. And we'll update the global goal in our list. B has no more neighbours, and uh, we've now visited it, so we can tick B off. We can cross it off our list. We'll sort the list which means we need to flip these around, so that becomes C and then E. And we'll check node C. Well, node C has three neighbours. Uh, the first one is B, so C's local is 3 plus the 1. Well, that's not less than 2. And you can kind of tell that this is stopping the algorithm from going backwards. So C doesn't get to update B. Let's try neighbour E. So we've got 3 plus the 1, well, 4 isn't less than E's local, so C doesn't get to update E either. And this is quite good, because so far the algorithm has learnt that the path to C is three steps going through B, but the path to C through E is only two steps. So the algorithm is stopping itself from going back. The only neighbour left to check then is D. So we'll take the 3 local, so 3 plus the distance 2 is 5, which isn't less than D's local. So C doesn't get to update D. In fact, C is pretty boring. It's, it's, it's established that it's not part of the shortest path. A shortest path has already been found. So we can now finish with C. We've visited it, so we can cross that off our list. And we've only got one node left to check, which is E. And so one last time, let's check the neighbours. So we'll check A first. We've got E's local, 1 plus 1 isn't less than 0. So, E doesn't get to update A. We'll try C. 1 plus 1, well, that is less than 3, so E gets to update C. So the first thing that will happen is C gets a new owner. E. The local E of 1 plus the distance 1 is 2, so we change this 3 to a 2. And we'll modify the global goal with the heuristic, which becomes the local plus the distance to the end. In this case, it's a 4. The next neighbour, let's assume, is D. So we take E's local, 1, plus 5. Well, that's 6. 6 isn't less than 4, so E doesn't get to update D, which leaves only one neighbour left. And we've got E's local, 1, plus the distance to F, 1, is 2. 2 is less than 3, so we get to update F. So we'll change the owner, and we can change the local, which is E's local plus the distance. This just becomes a 2. And we can change the global, which is 2 plus the distance to the target. So in this case, the global becomes 3. And we're now done with E, and that means our nodes to test list is empty. So now what? Well, if we take our end node, we can look at who owns it. In this case, F owns it. So let's draw a path backwards to F. Well, if we look at who owns F, E owns it. So, let's go backwards towards E. And if we look at who owns E, well, A owns it. So we'll go all the way back, and we're back at our starting point. And this path will be the shortest path, and we can see that it is, because A to E is 1, E to F is 1, and F to D is 1. So the total number of steps is 3. All of the other paths have more steps. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the A-star algorithm. Let's now code it up. As usual, the first thing we'll need to do is set up the console game engine by creating a derived class. And I've done that, and I've set the console to be 160 by 160, and each character is to be 6 by 6 pixels. As we've just seen, the whole algorithm revolves around the concept of nodes. So I'm going to add in a node structure, and the node contains is the node an obstacle or not? Now, we didn't cover that in the walkthrough, but it's actually a very simple addition to the algorithm. We'll come back to it. Has the node been visited? We saw that with the ticks and whether it goes in the list. Its global goal score, its local goal score, which are floats. Uh, its position in space. Now, we're going to need that to calculate the heuristic, amongst other things. 
uh, we have a vector of pointers to other node structures to represent the neighbours, and we have a final pointer to another node, which is its parent. Now because each node does have its own x and y coordinates, the nodes can exist anywhere in space, but I'm going to arrange them in a grid because it's convenient to draw and it's convenient to demonstrate. However, there is no real concept of north, east, west and south in this arrangement. Now for the demonstration program, we're going to need some nodes, so I'm creating a pointer which will hold an array of nodes, and I'm going to have 16 by 16 of them in a grid. But don't forget, the fact it's in a grid is not important. And in the onUserCreate function, I want to define my nodes. So the first thing I do is allocate the memory, and then I iterate through each of the nodes and initialize it. So I set the x and y coordinate, and I set none of them to obstacles, because right now I just want them all to be pathable nodes. Uh, they, none of them have any parents, and none of them have been visited. And this is where things may get a bit confusing, because the node structure contains information that will change during the path planning routines, but also information about its state in this demonstration. Combining two different descriptions into a single structure is not good programming practice. However, to keep this demo simple, I think it'll be okay. Now we've got some nodes, it's time to draw them, and we'll do that in the onUserUpdate function. The first thing I'll add is the node size and the node border. This is just to make it aesthetically pleasing. And the node size is the pitch in between individual nodes, and the node border is how many pixels not to draw around the edge. So it makes them look like they're floating islands. As usual, first thing we'll want to do is clear the screen. So I'm going to draw a space to all locations, and then using a simple nested for loop, I'm going to draw a rectangle to represent the node. And it looks a little bit long-winded, but that's only because I'm calculating the coordinates all in one go. So I'm taking the uh, top left coordinates and the bottom right coordinates of a node, including all of its node border and everything else, and I'm just drawing it as a blue rectangle. So let's have a look, see, see if that looks okay. Excellent. Some of the nodes I want to specify as being obstacles or not. Uh, so I'm going to use the mouse to get this information. So to get the node's coordinates, I'm taking the mouse position, uh, which is in uh, pixel space across the console, and I'm uh, using an integer division to give me uh, a nicely rounded number of which node has been selected. The integer division will get rid of the remainder for me. And I can check if the left mouse button has been clicked by uh, looking at the released flag, because this is only set for one frame. And if it has been clicked, I then check to see if my coordinates are valid. Are they within the dimensions of my node array? So are they between 0 and 16? And if they are, I want to set the obstacle flag of the node to be the inverse of what it already is. So it toggles on and off. And I'm, I'm accessing the node. This is why it was convenient to put it into a grid, because I can take the y coordinate and the x coordinate to access the node. I don't need to check all of my nodes individually to see if they've been hit. And we can see here that I just take the obstacle flag and I set it to not whatever it was before. So this will toggle it on and off. So now we've got two states of the node, we should draw both states. And I'm going to do that by modifying my uh, draw rectangle function into something the same. Again, it's got the same coordinate system, so it looks a little bit complicated. But in, I'm choosing the colour based on whether the obstacle flag has been set. So if it's an obstacle, I'm drawing it as white, and if it isn't, I'm drawing it as blue. I'm using a half-shaded pixel here, because it gives me a few more shades. Uh, if you're not sure what that really means, check out the uh, webcam at the command line video. Let's take a look now. So we can see everything has been shaded, and as I click on individual squares, they get set to grey. Now at the moment my nodes are just floating in space. We can't path through them because they're not connected to each other. So we'll establish a routine now to set uh, north, south, east and west connections between the nodes. Because we've arranged them in a grid, this is quite easy to do algorithmically. And all I'm going to need are two uh, for loops, which are going to iterate through all of the cells. For example, let's say I wanted to add a connection between the current node and its northern neighbour. I can find the current node's address by y times the width of my node array plus x. We've seen that in many previous videos. And I can get the vector of neighbours for that node and push to the back of it the address of the node above it. And I use the same coordinate indexing strategy to work out what the address is. In this case, it's just the y coordinate minus 1, i.e. the node above me. But I need to be careful because if I'm on the top row, I'll be attempting to connect to nodes that don't exist, so I want to check for that. And therefore, it's a similar process for the southern connections. I don't want to check beyond the bottom row of the array. 
Similarly, we can do things in the x-axis, so we're linking up the west and eastern neighbours. Let's now update our drawing routines to draw the connections, and we're going to draw them behind the nodes, so we'll draw them before the nodes. And this is because our connections are going to be drawn from the centre of each node location to the centre of each neighbouring location. So I go through each node individually, and then I auto-scroll through its vector of neighbours. Let's take a look. And very nice, we can see the neighbours are connected to their immediate north, west, south and east, except for around the boundary. We'll need to record our start and end locations, so I'm going to add two more variables which are just pointers to the node structure, node start and node end. And in the onUserCreate function I'm going to give these uh, a default value. Uh, and I've just chosen uh, something along the uh, halfway down and a little bit in from the edges. And to identify these as being different from the other nodes, I'm going to colour them red and green, which we'll do by modifying our draw node routine. So now it draws the node as normal, and in the special cases of it being a start or an end node, it just simply overwrites what are already there with a green and a red colour. Now at this point I'm also going to add some more drawing, because I'm going to get it to draw whether the node has been visited or not, and we'll use this to evaluate the performance of the algorithm. So if a node has its visited flag set when it's drawn, I'm going to draw it in blue, but I'm going to use the solid uh, pixel type as opposed to the half type before, and this gives us that nice shading between the two. Drawing the path, if you remember, involves taking the end location and drawing it backwards following the parents. So if the end location is not null, I'm going to create a temporary pointer to the node, and I'm going to use this pointer to follow the parent pointers back through the chain. So if the node does have a parent, I can effectively find the parent's parent, and so forth. So I follow it on parent to parent to parent to parent. And in a similar way that we drew the connections between the node centres, I'm going to use exactly the same code except I'm going to draw a yellow line, and this time it's between the current node's location and the parent's node's location. And this loop will repeatedly go through all of the parents from the end all the way to the start, because the start location doesn't have a parent, it is null pointer, and that's when this uh, routine will end. So I'll just check everything's still working. We can see the end, I can draw blocks, uh, but now I want to reposition the start and end points, and I want to do that with the shift and control keys. So we'll modify our mouse released function. Under normal circumstances this is currently toggling on or off whether the node is an obstacle or not, but if we hold the shift key that's when we'll position the start node, and if we hold the control key that's when we'll position the end node, otherwise we'll just toggle an obstacle. Let's just see if that works. So I'm holding down shift, and I'm clicking and we can see we're moving the start node around. I hold down control and if I'm not holding anything down I'm drawing blocks. Now the only problem with the A star algorithm is I can't really construct it in stages like this and then demonstrate how it works. I've really just got to put all of the code in at once. So to my class I'm going to add another function solve A star. And this will update the graph and update all of the parents and the global goals and local goals accordingly. But before we can do any solving, the first thing we need to do is reset all of the nodes to a known state. And if you remember through the manual walkthrough before, we set our global goals and local goals to infinity. And we set all the visited flags to false, and none of the nodes have any parents. And here again is the convenience of representing the nodes as a grid. We can access them quite easily. We don't need to scroll through all of the nodes uh, in the list. Now in the manual version demonstrated, we already had the distances between the nodes, they were there drawn on the screen. We don't know them in this case, so we're going to use Pythagoras' theorem to work them out, and we're going to do this a lot. So I'm going to create a lambda function to do just that, that takes two nodes and gives me the distance between their centre points. We also need to calculate a heuristic, and for bog standard A star, the heuristic is simply just the distance again. So even though I've created another lambda function to do this, right now all it does is return the distance. I'm doing this so we can play around with the heuristic and see what effects it has on the algorithm. Once all our nodes are established, we need to set up the start node. So I'm creating a temporary variable called node current, and this is the node that we're currently exploring, the one that we're working with, so it starts off at the beginning. And as before, we set the local goal to zero, and we set the global goal to be the heuristic, which in this case is just really the distance between the start and end locations. And this is the distance as the crow flies. It's this that biases the algorithm towards success. 
We then need to maintain a list of nodes that have not been tested, or nodes that are to be tested. So I'm just going to use a standard list of node pointers, and to this list I'm going to add the starting node. And now we start implementing the algorithm. I'm going to sit in a while loop, making sure that I've got nodes to test. So as soon as my list is empty, I can assume the algorithm has completed. And then the first step of the algorithm is to sort this list into ascending order of global goals. Well, to begin with, the list only has one element in, so the sort is rather redundant. But I've used the uh, list sort. You can't use the standard sort here because it doesn't work on lists, and that's because lists don't have any random access iterators. Which is unlike a vector, because you can access a vector at any location. With a list, you have to scroll through the list in order to get to the next item. The sort function can take a lambda function to implement the sort, so I'm going to be sorting it based on the global goal. This then implies that the element at the start of the list has the lowest global goal, so it's probably the best solution to take. However, our list may also contain nodes we've already visited and we don't want to operate on them again. So if the front of the list contains a node that we've already visited, one we've already processed, then just get rid of it and move on to the next one. But it's always risky removing things from lists because we may end up with an empty list and if we do, we want the algorithm to terminate. So now we know the node at the front of the list is potentially the best candidate to finding the shortest path, let's set our current node to the front of the list and set it to visited because we're going to explore it now. We now want to iterate through each of the node's neighbours. And I'm going to use the auto keyword in a for loop to do this conveniently because the vector here contains all of the connections to our neighbours. Now if we've not visited the neighbour, we want to add it to our list. But there's also one other condition, and this is slightly different to the manual example, in that if our node neighbor is an obstacle, we also don't want to add it to the list. And so simply put, if the neighbor has been visited, we don't care. We don't want to add it to our testing list because we've already done it. And if the neighbor is an obstacle, there's still no point in processing it because we can't pass through it. After updating the neighbor list, the next step is to calculate our local goals and we want to check if the current local goal plus the distance to the neighbor is less than the neighbor's local goal. And here we're using the distance lambda function again. And if it is, then we update our neighbor. So here I'm setting the neighbor's parent to the current node. I'm setting the local goal to the possibly local goal variable, which was the current node's local plus the distance. And then I set the neighbor's heuristic, which calls our heuristic lambda function added to the local goal. So this is exactly what we were working out by hand before. And so this chunk of code implements our A star algorithm. It's not very much, but the two crucial parts are whether we're checking if a neighbor is an obstacle and updating the heuristic. Now when we work through it manually, you might think that the global goal doesn't contribute very much. We didn't seem to do very much with it other than setting, but it's really important because it's based on the heuristic. Overall, how well are we doing on that path? And that, that value is used to sort the list we know that we're trying the best possible paths first. So it's trying to optimize the speed of finding the shortest path from start to finish. There's one final thing to do, and that is if we make any changes to the scene, we want to run our solve a star function. Let's have a play with it. So if I draw a block in straight away, we can see it's found a path. And if I interrupt that path, it keeps trying to find the shortest path. And this is guaranteed to be the shortest path because what we can see is all of the nodes have highlighted to blue. And if I make some uh, rather aggressive blockages, so if I block off half of the array, we can see it's never bothered to test those because it can't. However, this still seems a little redundant. In fact, if we're not bothered about finding the absolute shortest path and just want to find a path which is going to get there and is going to be reasonably short, we can add another term to the while loop and that is to simply stop searching when we've reached the end. It might not be the shortest path, but it is a valid path and it might be good enough. And so now we can see it doesn't search the whole space, it stops once it's satisfied its objective. And so it's searching much fewer cells. Instead of just connecting to our north, south, east and west neighbours, why not connect to all of our immediate neighbours? So we'll connect diagonally but we have to make the same checks as we did before to make sure we don't go out of bounds. Let's take a look. So now we can see all of the connections and this gives us diagonal pathing opportunities. And we see we get a nice smooth transition as it exploits being able to travel 
via diagonals. Of course it can go through our path now because our connections aren't obstacles, it's only the nodes that are obstacles. And I think it's quite interesting to see how it develops and explores the space. And so after much playing around we can see the path is also not afraid to go back on itself. If there's a solution, this algorithm will find it. Another thing to play with is to change the heuristic. So if we set our heuristic to 1, i.e. we don't bias the algorithm in any particular direction towards the goal, we can see that it explores a lot more space before it comes to a solution. In fact, you get a wave front. If I put this in the top corner and put this one in the bottom corner, it has to explore the whole array. And this makes A star behave in exactly the same way as Dijkstra's algorithm, or Dijkstra's algorithm, depending on where you're from. But having the heuristic certainly makes it a little more optimal, so we'll leave it in for now. And so there you have it, a rather rushed look at the A star algorithm uh, being used for path planning. There are other path planning algorithms out there, but A star's a pretty good one to start with, and most other path planning algorithms are simply variations of a theme. As always, the code's going to be available on GitHub. If you've enjoyed this video, give me a big thumbs up, have a think about subscribing, and I'll see you next time. Take care.